Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning for your message, God. We, we, we bless you because we love you, because you're such an amazing Father. You're not an author of confusion because whatever you say is you know, exact and you are a timely God, you're a seasonal God, and we know you're with us in this season. Father, we just bless your word this morning as it's coming out. Father, I pray none of me but all of you, God. And I would just pray for the fertile heart who is ready to receive, O oh Lord. Father, we pray you nourish our hearts, O oh Lord, and just help that word to come in and, and make root and, and, you know, and, be, and be nourished, O oh God, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Excellent. Thank you so much. The text from this message will be from the book of 1 Samuel chapter 1. And I'm going to be reading, it's quite a long verse actually, but I've, I've sort of break into two. So I'm going to start reading from the first half. We're going to split this into two halves. The first half we're going to do from two to eight. And I think this is quite an interesting verse, and I will introduce this verse shortly before I introduce the title of my message. And I think in this verse, this chapter is talking about, um, basically this story is about Hannah. And Hannah has a husband called Elikana. So we're going to pick it up from verse two. Because verse 1 is just literally giving you the genealogy of Elikai, and I'm sure you all get bored if you start hearing this begets that and all that. So I think we're going to start from verse 2. Elikana had two wives, Hannah and Penina. Penina had children, Hannah did not. Each year, Elikana would travel to Shiloh to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of Heaven's army at the tabernacle. The priest and the God at the time the priests of the Lord at that time were two sons of Eli, Ophni and Phinehas. On the day Elikana presented his sacrifice, he would give portion of the meat to Penina and each of her children. And he, although he loved Anna, he would only give her one choice portion because the Lord has given her no children. So Penina would taunt Anna and make fun of her because the Lord has kept her from having children. Years after year, it was the same. Penina would taunt Hannah and they, and they went to the tabernacle. Each time, Hannah would be reduced to tears and would not even eat. Why are you crying, Hannah? Elikana asked. It's quite obvious, isn't it, really? <laughs> why, are you, why aren't you eating? Why be downhearted just because you have no children? Thank you, Jesus. You have me. Isn't that better than 10 sons? I will stop here for now. And I think it's quite interesting, although this is not really the meat of what God is sharing this morning. But I think this first two, this first verses are very important because God was telling me a lot of us in this room can relate to this part of Hannah's story. Constant taunting by people around us about our deficiencies. And often this might be from people who loves us the most. And I dare say often this might be from Christians. This wasn't happening in the club or in the street. This was in the tabernacle. If you guys don't know, the tabernacle was church. But yet, this woman was still getting taunted. Often we feel judgment and taunting come from our fellow Christians. And the reality is, I just want to encourage us this morning that God loves us. Because sometimes these taunting come from what people see as our deficiencies and also sometimes what we see as our deficiencies. We think we should have been X and Y by now. By now I should have been married. By now I should have had my house. By now I should have had my promotion. By now I should have had that mortgage. And yet people around us, Christian brothers, our husbands, our siblings, our friends, would drop slight comments to taunt us, to press on that nerve. And I think I just want to encourage us this morning that God sees you and God is with you. And I think the message today is hopefully going to help us to understand what God is up to in that moment. That moment of where we're praying for something to happen and the moment here where we receive that. What is happening in that middle? And I think this is what we're going to be talking about this morning. The second part there I thought was quite contentious because actually God really spoke to me on this and I was I felt personally convicted. That's from verse 8 when, you know, Elikana, um, Elikana said to Hannah, why are you crying? That's a bit stupid, isn't it, really? <laughs> you know, she knows every, he knows every year this woman comes here to pray and he hasn't got a child. But you see what he did there? 
and say, why are you not, why are you crying and why are you not eating? And often, I don't know about you guys, you guys are probably all saints, but I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm probably not as holy as everyone here. But often I find myself, when the person closest to you is going through a difficult situation, rather than meeting them at where they are and supporting them, you try to deflect. We know it doesn't just take one person to make child, right? Yeah. Elikano probably was just as responsible for Hannah's barrenness as her. But you see what he said there? Typical what? I think a lot, I think a lot, of, Afri- I think a lot of African parents are good at this stuff. Deflecting. Is, am I not better than 10 sons? Some people call this gaslighting. And I think sometimes, you know, I can only speak for myself and perhaps some men here. We often find ourselves in this situation. Our wife is going through things. Rather than meeting them where they are, we feel uncomfortable to get to that vulnerable place with them and we try to deflect and come, come, come at them as something we think seems logical. At least you've got this. He it said, it said, it's very interesting what it says there. It's, it used the word just. And I can't remember the part there. And I just thought that is so, it's trying to belittle something that's been taunting this woman for many years. But I think it's important to understand that God our Father sees us during this process. God our Father sees us in the darkest place where we feel that perhaps no one else sees us. Where that pain, where we feel people around us that we trust to support us are not supporting us as much as we want to. As believers, we need to understand that our God is a good, good Father. I remember that song once. I was going through some season in my life and I was just singing that song to myself and just crying. I didn't even understand. I know Pastor Steve, though, I'm in touch with my emotions and sometimes, you know, it does, it does come out sometimes. But I strongly believe our God is a good, good Father. He's the Father that wants the best for us. The book of Matthew chapter 7, verse 9 to 11 says, What a man is there amongst you? Who ask a son for bread and gives a stone? Or a fish and gives snake? How much more? How much more your father in heaven gives you gift to those who have asked him? This is our father speaking to us directly. He always wants the best for us. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know this won't be brought. He said, for I know the plans that are for you. They are to plan to prosper you, to give you a hope and an expected end. This is the Word of God, not me. So really, when we are coming to God in that season of this dejection and praying for God to give us something, and this season here where we feel the abundance, that middle part there, we need to understand that God wants the best for us. But the question here is, what happens if, like Hannah, we ask God repeatedly for something? but yet we're still waiting for answers. It feels like God is not hearing us. It feels like God is not on our team anymore. It feels like God doesn't like us. Sometimes we get to that place where he doesn't even like, God doesn't like me. God is not your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your husband. God is your father. He loves you unconditionally. No matter how bad you are, no matter how crazy you are, God is your father and he still loves you regardless. Isaiah 59.1 says, His arms are not too short, too weak to save you. Neither is his ears too deaf to hear you. So when you're in your darkest moment praying to God, although you might not see the manifestation of what you're praying for, God hears you and God is ready to deliver you. But often we struggle to really lay hold on what God is saying here. And I just say we because I'm definitely one of them. Even during this week, you know, it's so funny because I know God definitely has a word for someone here this, you know, today. I, had, I mean, my wife can testify. I had a really, 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 I wouldn't say bad, really challenging week. There's a lot going on in my mind. And I was just walking through uh, the park on my way to work. And God's just ministered to me and just said, listen, I'm still here. And Sean, bless her, sent a text about a song. And I was just like, babe, that was so needed because actually I've forgotten that I have a God that's got my back. I just thought I could get through this by myself and I was just plowing through, plowing through. And constantly my mind was full of worry and doubt and guilt. And it's just, 
and I was just stressed. I used the word. <laughs> but that Friday, because, and God told me, devil wanted you to feel this way because actually when you're stressed during your week and maybe on Monday, Sunday morning, it clicks in that you need to minister. And at that time, the quality of what God might be trying to say because I've just let the whole week just take out all the stress of this world to get to me. But I'm glad that God is a God of restoration. Amen. <laughs> Often we struggle to believe what this text is saying. You know, the text is saying his ears are not, he's not deaf to hear us. But the reality is we're praying years and we're still not getting it. And, the, and often we feel like we're in this place, what I call the waiting room. And that's the title of my message today, in the waiting room. What does it feel like being in the waiting room? I strongly believe one of us, I strongly believe all of us here falls into three categories. I fall into all three, by the way. It's either we are coming into a waiting room, we're, wait, we're, we're coming into a request from God and we're expecting God to give us a breakthrough, or we're in a waiting room where we've been praying for years for something and we're still not receiving an answer, or some of us who are very lucky has just received their breakthrough and coming out of a waiting room. But the reality is, at some point in your life, you were either in a waiting room or you're in a waiting room or you're going to be in a waiting room. And it's important to understand that how you manage your waiting room will determine how you come out of it. How you manage your waiting room will determine your experience in the waiting room. I'm not a singer, but I remember this song when I was in university. You know, it talks about, tell me what do you do when you've done all you can. Seems like it's never enough. Tell me what do you say when friends run away it's, or you're all alone. And the song kind of just crescendo into saying, you just have to stand. You just have to stand in God's word because God is the only person that can take you through a dark waiting room and can guide you through that waiting room into coming into realization that yes, victory is of the Lord. How do we react in a waiting room? How do we act whilst in a waiting room? And the reality is our behavior, our beliefs, our heart posture will determine our experience in the waiting room. And I dare say, sometimes might determine our duration in the waiting room. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah 40, 40 verse 29 to 30, it said, it gives strength to the weary and increase the power of the weak. Even young grows tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But, oh, this is the favorite part. But those who wait upon the Lord, He will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagle. They will run and not be weary. And this part defies every logical odds. I went for a run this morning, after knowing I'm going to deliver this message. I had my gospel music in my ear. I was, you know, I prayed this morning. I said, yeah, I'm going to go for a run. And let's see if I'm going to run and not be weary. <laughs> 30 seconds into my run, I said, I want to go back home. <laughs> But I thank God for grace because I managed to at least, to, you know, I did what I needed to do and I came home. But the reality is this text doesn't make sense with a carnal mind. How can you run and not get weary? We had a London Marathon the other day. The guy that won it didn't finish and said, I'm going to go for another one. He was probably shattered. I didn't watch it, but I'm sure he was shattered. <laughs> Because science will tell you, to run, when you run, you build up lactic acid and you become tired. You get muscle cramps. But the Lord is saying here, those who wait upon the Lord, their strength will be renewed. But what God is helping us to realize here, there is some level of strengthening that needs to happen whilst in the waiting room. There is some level of empowering. There is some level of equipping that needs to happen whilst in the waiting room. Waiting often makes the heart weary. We go for an interview to say, I'll get back to you in 24, 48 hours. After six hours, I think I haven't heard from them. Oh my gosh, what's happening? I haven't got a job. That's normal, that's natural. But waiting upon the Lord is quite different. Because it says, those that wait upon the Lord, they have the strength renewed. Because often whilst we're waiting, 
I strongly believe God is taking us on a journey. And it's often a journey that might require pruning. It might require addition. Or it might require taking away. That, is very, that might be very hard for some people. God is trying to get you ready for that next step. And I think that's what God is telling us today in church. God is trying to get Life City ready for that outburst of His manifestation. I remember Pastor Steve's message at the start of the year. I remember this because I think he said, you know, the house on the hill, the light. And I just, and my mind was just telling me, God is about to make Life City a pillar of light in Croydon. But well, actually, we need to be equipped. We need to equip ourselves. Because when this time comes, how, how are we as a church going to usher, uh, usher people closer and closer to God as we expand? So we as a church are in a waiting room. And God is constantly working on us. God is constantly trying to, you know, strengthen us whilst we're there. I'm going to go back to that text again. I'm going to, we're going to pick it up from verse 9. This is after Hannah has obviously left his gaslighting husband and also his other wife who is, you know, who is who, who are literally taunting her, making her life miserable. What does she do? Verse 9. I'm going to read this to 20, so it's going to be a bit long, so please bear with me. Often after a sacrificial meal at Shiloh, Hannah would get up, would, Hannah got up and went to pray. Eli, the priest, was sitting at the customary place beside the entrance of the tabernacle. Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. And she made her vow, O Lord of heaven's army, if you would look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer, I will give and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire life. And as a sign that he has been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will never be cut." As she was praying, the Lord, as she was praying to the Lord, Eli watched her, seeing her lips moving, but hearing no sound. He thought she had been drinking. Must you come here drunk? He demanded. Throw away your wine. Oh, no, sir, she replied. I haven't been drinking wine or anything strong, but I am very discouraged and I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. Don't think I'm a wicked woman because I have been praying out of great anguish. In that case, in that case, in that case, Eli said, go in peace. May the Lord God of Israel grant you your request. Grant the request you have asked him. Oh, thank you, sir. She exclaimed. Then she went back to be and began to eat and she was no longer sad. The story obviously concluded with Hannah giving birth to Samuel, which we know. Well, I think if we go back to verse 14 there, it's very interesting when Eli came to Hannah and accused her wrongly, clearly. Yeah. Are you drunk? No, he didn't even ask. He said, you were drunk. Throw away your wine. And if you realize, because what happened in verse 16, when he said, in that case, then the blessing followed. That's the rubber stamp. And then the outbreak happened. Right at the edge of that breakthrough, all the taunting that Hannah has been receiving, has been training her for this moment. Because I don't know about you, if I don't like my pastor and they come to me and start accusing me falsely, I'd say, excuse me? <laughs> and often a lot of us feel that way. We're so quick to hop from church to church because we don't like the ministering coming out of the pulpit. Sometimes there are some, you know, bad stuff coming. That's a good time to leave, by the way. But, <laughs> but sometimes... Is for trivial stuff. Oh, this person didn't greet me this morning. They're looking at me funny. Sorry, I'm, I'm going. Anna has had training with the husband gaslighting her, the wife taunting her, you know, all the, all the rejections she's felt, all the rejection, the mockery, the abuse, the feeling of incompetence she's had before has prepared her for this moment because actually the product of it is how she was able to respond to Eli when clearly Eli was accusing her wrongly. And the question here is, what is God trying to weed out of us? What is God trying to work through in us so actually, when we're at the edge of our breakthrough, we're able to respond well and we're able to walk into that miracle that God has created for us. 
That's what I mean by when you're in your weight, a lot of strengthening needs to happen. A lot of strengthening is happening while you're in the waiting room. You know, the song said, I don't mind waiting on the Lord. Because waiting on the Lord, although might defy normal understanding, but actually there's a lot of lessons that can be learned. And the reality is we struggle, we always struggle to see that lesson whilst we're in that, by the way. I remember one of, whilst I was in medical school, I, I went through a phase where you, I, I, I caught me, although a lot of you guys might think, come on, like, that wasn't that deep, but for me it was deep by that time. You know, I failed my exam, I had to retake the year. And going through secondary school, you've always done well. And actually, for me, that was my first encounter of failure. And I was devastated. I was devastated. But actually, God was taking me through something during that year of retake. I remember listening to this message called Strategically Ordered Steps. And that was the turning point of my life because I had six months of just going wild. I didn't go to church, I didn't do anything. I know you think, oh, come on, it's not that deep. But for me, it was, okay, don't judge me. (laughs) But but the reality was, if I had to redo my life again, I would want that year to be in there. And that's what we need to understand where we're in the waiting room because there is something God is trying to get in us. There's something God is trying to get out of us that he needs to prepare us for. So when, when we are in the fullness of his blessing, we're able to deal with it. We're able to maintain what he's given us. And that's what I want us to understand this morning. The question here is, I mean, what does it look like how not to wait on the Lord? And we might not have time to read this, but in the book of Genesis 16, this is the story of um, Abraham and Sarah. Obviously, the Lord promised Abraham. We can bring up um, four, um, verse 4 to 5, but I'm just going to give you a little bit of synopsis. The Lord promised Abraham and said, I'm going to make you a father of many nations, and you're, you're going to have loads of, you're, you're going to have a son. Years went by. Physiologically, Sarah was saying, I can't have a child anymore because probably my ovaries are giving up. And what did Sarah did? He said, hang on, actually. Maybe God just wants us to try and help him and... Why don't you have your, my, you know, she's my maid anyway. You know, wherever is, she's my maid, so wherever, she's my, wherever she has is mine. So why don't you sleep with her? So when she has a child, then she's mine because I don't know if this God is actually, maybe he still doesn't, maybe he doesn't remember. Or maybe, oh, oh, maybe this is how he wants to do it. Maybe he wants us to use our kind of mind to help him. And obviously, in verse 4 and 5, we, we, we heard about how Abraham, you know, slept with, I can't remember, Haggai. Abraham slept with Haggai, and then she gave birth to his child. Instantly, jealousy, envy came in. So sometimes, when we try to fashion things our own way, we know the result is off track from what God wants from us. And actually, we're trying to fashion... Thank you, Lord. We're trying to fashion things in a way where, but we need to understand that our level of understanding is only based on our experience. God's level of understanding is infinite. You know, it's infinite. So actually, we might not understand what God is doing or how God wants to do it, and that's okay. But when we try to use our level of understanding, my ovaries are giving up. Okay, so let's get this young girl whose ovaries are still good because actually that's God's that's way of, you know, we, God's giving us brain anyway, so let's help God with this thing. And we saw the, we saw the, the, the cascade of event that happened. Obviously, we know our guy gave birth to Ishmael. We then started the you know, nation of Islam. Only if, we would wait on the Lord and have our strength renewed and mount up with wings like eagle and run and not be weary. The other person that kind of didn't get it right when it comes to waiting, there's several examples in the Bible. I've just picked this too. The other one was Moses. Moses never saw the promised land, by the way. He never saw the promised land and there was something Moses had in him that God was trying to prune off. You remember when he was in Egypt, a young guy in Egypt, he saw the Hebrew person being mistreated. He, was, he got hangry. And he killed that person. 
Fast forward many decades later, the children of Israel was moaning at Moses, I need water, I need water. He spoke to God, God said, go and speak to the rock, hallelujah. But what did Moses did? Out of anger, he struck the rock twice. He tried to fashion it in his own way because I know that I had that rod to part the Red Sea, so this is how God did it. So actually what God, maybe God actually didn't mean talk because actually if, if God knows how these Israelites are moaning at me, he wouldn't just say, go and talk to the rock because maybe the rock wouldn't even hear me. But instead, I'm going to get my staff and strike the rock twice because that's the only way God, I need to help God to help these people because actually my way, because I've done it before, so maybe I have an idea of how to do it now. But the reality was, God always looks after his people. The water still came out of the rock. The people of Israel drank and they were fine. But that consequence of that was God said, you will, never, you will see the promised land, but you never walk into it. And I want us to understand that this morning, there are certain ways where we can wait on the Lord. And we'll talk through that. I've got five points on how we can wait on the Lord. The children of Israel with a golden calf, whilst waiting, they got tired of waiting in the wilderness because actually what they know is back in Israel, we have a God, that, you, know, we, you know, the Israelites worship a certain God, but now this God has taken us out of captivity and now we're in wilderness. Where is it? Because Moses has gone up to the mountain to get the, to get the, to get the commandment and they put pressure on Aaron to say we need a symbol of God because actually the way we know how it's done in Egypt is they worship a golden calf or a God and that led to them forcing Aaron to agree to building a golden calf and when Moses was coming down from the mountain he was upset and actually geographically from where they left to the promised land apparently I don't I'm not really good at geography it was meant to take 40 days but it took them over 40 years how are you waiting in your waiting room And I think God is speaking to every single one of us this morning because there's a lot of things God is trying to either take out of our life, particularly take out of our life, yeah. that we can only be free of those if we key into God. The Bible says in proof of Proverbs chapter 3, 5 to 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge me and he will direct your path. In all your ways, acknowledge me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Five ways to wait on the Lord. Five ways. Five things to do whilst waiting on the Lord. Number one, complete submission to God. Hannah completely submitted everything to God. So much so he was willing to give back what he was praying for. That's stupid, right? I want God to give me a car, but actually when he gives me the car, I'm going to donate to Life City. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> but the book of Job 22, 21 says, submit to God and you will have peace. Then things will go well for you. I underline that peace in my Bible because actually there's some level of peace that comes when we submit to God. And what I mean by submitting to God is you know that now it's all about God. Even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I fear no evil because you are with me. And for me, in a way, that gives me that reassurance because actually all God asks from us, all God expects from us, trust and obey. And he will do the rest. I'm not saying you have an interview tomorrow and trust and obey and I don't study, No. God still wants us to do our due diligence. But there is some level of peace that comes in our hearts when we know that I have done my part and I am trusting God. And because He's a good, good Father, He will give me the desires of His heart. Remember, I didn't say your heart because sometimes we need to check our desires. Is it in line with what God wants us to be? And that's, how we, that, that's what submission does because submission gives us the heart of the Lord. It helps us to understand what God's purpose is for our life. Sometimes submission stops us from wasting unnecessary time in a wrong waiting room. You want to see an orthopedic surgeon, but you're in an ophthalmology waiting room. You're in the wrong place. 
And sometimes we need to understand what God is saying to us concerning what we're waiting on. And how do we do that? By complete submission to God. The second thing, get the Word of God in. The Bible said the Word of God is sharper than two-edged sword, cutting and divide. And it's so important because Jesus was only able to defeat devil when he was tempting him by the Word. He said, for it is written... We cannot draw from an empty well. I went to Nigeria with my wife towards the, um, last year and she saw some of the amazing life I lived when I was in Nigeria. And we had to fetch water from a well. You know, there's water in there. You throw the bucket in, water comes out. Sometimes during the dry season, there's no water in the well. You throw the water bucket and then nothing comes out. That's the way the word of God is. What are you declaring? What's, what's, your, what's the word? What's the word? If, the, if you don't get the word of God in, what's going to come out? So when the devil comes with you with one thing, what are you saying to the devil? And number three is declaration. So that leads nicely from the word. Because what is your declaration? The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We have to be so careful about what we say, what we use our tongue for. Proverbs 18, 21 said, A tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequence. As parents here, what are you declaring over your children's life? When you're upset with them, rather than bite your tongue and not say anything, are you saying those bad words to them? What are you saying to your friend's life? What are you declaring over your own life? There is power in the tongue. If we have time, we can read James chapter 3, verse 5. But essentially, in that text, the tongue was described as two things. One, it described the tongue as a rudder that steers the ship left and right, even in the midst of the strongest wind, right? And he also described the tongue as a fire. And that was, that's, that's just quite important because actually what you declare out of, your, out of your mouth can change the course of your destiny. But equally, it could corrupt your destiny. So our declaration has to be very important. Whilst you are healed, say, by his stripes we are healed. When we're going through a difficult situation, the word of God is there for every situation we're going through, good, bad, or ugly, because actually the word of God is something we can declare and why is declaration important? Because we need to understand that often the battle we're fighting in the waiting room are spiritual battles. Although we see the manifestation in the physical, but actually the foundation is spiritual. So actually when we're declaring, it's not because we're trying to you know, make ourselves feel good because a lot of this self-motivational book talks about that. You know, I listen to some of this. But actually, no, it's because we're breaking down strongholds in the, de in the demonic kingdom. Because the Bible says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, power, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. That is what, we're, is what we're breaking down with our declaration. What are you declaring over your life in the waiting room? Not by power, not by might. But by your spirit, says the Lord. Zechariah chapter 4, 6. I find two more points. Number three. Number four. Pray without season. Prayer is absolutely key. What did we see Hannah do when everyone else has gone home? She went back and continued to pray. Because actually, he, she knows that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God through the pulling down of strongholds. She went back into the temple and continued to pray. And sometimes prayer is not about who is shouting the loudest, by the way. Because she was just quietly there talking to God and the priest for it she was drunk. But actually prayer is in that quiet, constant conversation with the Lord God. I strongly believe the Lord needs to raise prayer warriors in this church. Because the next place we're going, we need the prayer warriors as pillars to keep the building up. Not physical building, of course. That's why I thank God for the likes of um, the adults who are doing this prayer meeting every morning. And I think, you know, if God is leading to your heart to join that, please join them. Because actually, 
You cannot rely on Wednesdays every month. The God need, your personal prayer life needs to be equipped. My time is up and my last point. Believe he would do it. The book of Hebrews 12, 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. God does not respond to your need, but he responds to your faith, stirred up by need. That's from Pastor Steve, by the way, not me. But he told the woman with the issue of blood, he said, your faith has made you whole. We have to believe. There's something about God that we, we just have to get the believing. The guy in the Bible said, Lord, help my unbelief. Because, you know, sometimes we do doubt. The reason why I probably never went to God this week during my stressful time, because I just thought maybe it's just ain't got time about this stuff that I'm dealing with. But we need to believe that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. We're coming for landing now. Please just rise up, church, please. We're going to pray. I just want to use this time to just... I'm going to pray for three different, three groups of people this morning. And I just believe God is, God is about to set us free. God has certainly set me free whilst preparing for this message. And I believe there are people here who perhaps... Maybe it's your... Giving, you know, maybe it's in your surrendering, completely surrendering to God that maybe you feel, I'm quite a clever person, I can try and help God with some of the stuff I'm dealing with. Maybe we're struggling with the submission part. And if that's you today, that's, you know, God is willing to come and work with you to help you surrender and lay it all at the altar. Or maybe it's you this morning that You've just struggled to get the word in. Or you struggle with your declaration. You're so quick to declare negative things on your situation. But there is power in that declaration. And God wants to work on that this morning. God wants to change your testimony. God wants to change your declaration. And if that's you this morning, you fall into these two categories, just raise your hands up. We're just going to pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning because we love you. You're an awesome God. We surrender our lives to you this morning because we know you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think, Lord. We submit ourselves to you this morning because we've been struggling. We do believe you. We, do, we are Christians, but sometimes we just struggle to submit to you fully. Or sometimes we struggle to get a word in because the, the stress of this world just chokes it all out. We wake up. We want to go to the gym. We want to go to the work. We just struggle to get a word in or our declaration. Father, I pray from today, I decree and I declare about your word this morning, Lord. Help us this morning as we take that massive U-turn towards total submission, towards total surrendering, and towards positive declaration in Jesus' name. The second group and the final group of people I want to pray for this morning are people perhaps who have been struggling with unbelief. Maybe you've never met Christ before. And you'll be hearing all the stuff I've been saying for the last 40 minutes and you think, it doesn't really make sense, but I kind of I vibe with it a little bit. Maybe that's you and God wants to come and meet you because our God is a good, good father because irrespective of what you've done before, irrespective of what you did last night, even this morning, he still wants you and still loves you at your place. Or maybe you're the person this morning that perhaps you have believed once, where you've sort of backslidded. But you want to come back to God because actually you hear all the amazing stuff that God can do for you because He loves you. And we want to come back to Him. And if that's you this morning, I just want you to lift your hands and we're going to pray for you. Thank you very much. I see that hand. And I just want, us to, I want you to close your eyes and we're going to pray this together as a church. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you love me. I thank you you died for me. And today I turn for my sin and embrace my new life. I confess you as Lord and Savior. And from this day, and from this day, I will live my life for you. Yes, let's give the Lord a round of applause. Thank you so much, church.